This video will cover the first half of Chapter 8, Biopsychology, Cognitive Neuropsychology, and Clinical Neuropsychology for PSY 120, Careers in Psychology, Neuroscience, and Human Development. In the next, this chapter and the next, um, we'll be hitting some career areas that are, are likely to be of interest to those of you who are neuroscience majors but also those of you who are not, but also have an interest in biology and chemistry and kind of the interaction space between psychology and um, those fields. Um, there are many branches of psychology that um, are in this space where we're looking at the biological bases of human thinking, emotion, behavior, motivation, sensation and perception, and so on. So we're going to start our exploration by looking at what is often today called biopsychology back when um, I was a college student. So that would be in the, the, the mid to late eighties. It was referred to as physiological psychology. Um, the, this branch of psychology looks at the interaction between biology and behavior, um, but it's also become more complex than that. Um, biopsychology is um, one component of what has become the discipline of neuroscience. In some, at some universities, the neuroscience programs or departments, if there's a full department, um, exist outside of psychology. In some cases, as is the case at Mount Union, neuroscience is embedded within the larger psychology program. So there is some um, variation across uh, universities of where neuroscience sits. Uh, in some cases, it's very, very decidedly uh, connected to biology and chemistry. Um, in other cases, it's an outgrowth and shares a lot of underlying coursework with psychology. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind if you're interested in these, these various areas. The, the field of biopsychology and in, in some ways just the whole broader area of neuroscience involves lots of sub-disciplines. It can involve the study of neuroanatomy, um, looking at the brain and nervous system, neurochemistry, neuroendocrinology, endocrinology, um, neuropathology, and neuropharmacology. We have some of the basic coursework that takes into consideration many of these areas and we build that into our neuroscience program. Most people doing work in this area are either in, um, they're, they're either functioning as researchers um, in the context of academia or in the context of government and other private sector um, organizations such as pharmaceutical companies and research institutes. Cognitive neuropsychology is a um, an intersection between um, cognitive psychology and its biological underpinnings um, and integrating it into the study of the brain processes, the neural bases of things like thinking, memory, attention, and language. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a mixture of the subfield of cognitive psychology, which is all about cognitive processes, mental processes, thinking, memory, attention, and language. Um, but here we're looking at the neurological bases of those activities. Um, so it's like the biological bases of thought. Um, primarily, this is a research-oriented field um, where people are doing research and working in an academic setting, but they may be also be working in the private sector, um, particularly uh, contributing to applied areas such as rehabilitation. Clinical neuropsychology is the more directly applied side of, um, of neuroscience, of biopsychology. Clinical neuropsychology is like forensic, like um, health psychology. It's the application of a particular area of psychology to the clinical context. So here you're taking um, knowledge and expertise and training in the area of neuropsychology and adding it to the context of clinical and counseling. This application often involves um, doing neuropsychology assessments in a clinical context, 
um, looking at, uh, let's say, you know, a person has had a stroke, um, you will want to do a clinical neuropsych assessment in order to um, have a good understanding of what kind of deficits have resulted from the, the stroke and then to inform the decision making of rehabilitation specialists um, as they work to restore some function and help the person to recover um, post stroke. Same goes for other kinds of brain injuries. Um, other kinds of neurological conditions, including um, degenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. This field integrates basic biopsychology coursework as well as biology and chemistry coursework, um, such that people with clinical and counseling training can work with clients, both in terms of assessment and testing, but also in some cases in coping with the aftermath of what a, an injury or illness. Um, for example, I saw an interview many years ago um, with the clinical neuropsychologist who was working with a shooting survivor who had taken um, two bullet wounds to the brain, um, suffering some language deficits, some physical deficits, some changes in personality, um, definitely changes in cognition and language. So. Um, the clinical neuropsychologist talked about how, in addition to performing assessments and, and writing reports that were used by um, this person's uh, other caregivers, she was also involved in counseling um, the person in terms of the psychological aspects of recovery. Um, recovery from, from brain injuries is often complex and challenging um, and can involve a lot of psychological adaptation. These psychologists primarily, um, you know, responding to what I just said about performing counseling services, it's far more typical, however, for clinical neuropsychologists to be strictly involved in assessment and the development of intervention plans, uh, and in some cases, actually doing those interventions. Um, most likely, context for clinical neuropsychologists to be working in is in hospitals, clinics, private practice. They may also um, have academic positions in um, universities, in medical schools, um, and or in the private sector, in government and industry. If you have interest in these areas, such as the, the biological underpinnings of human behavior, cognition, and emotion, there are some bachelor's level opportunities for people to seek. And in some ways, these are the same kinds of bachelor's opportunities you would have as a um, degree holding uh, major in biology or chemistry or biochemistry, um, even in, in some other subdisciplines at undergraduate institutions. So being a, a science technician, there are a lot of different names for this. If you're searching on Indeed or another, um, job search uh, engine, you'll see these job, these positions labeled in lots and lots of different ways. Basically, techs are the people who do some of the um, kind of day-to-day -day bench work of assisting researchers in conducting experiments. My oldest daughter um, worked in a cancer lab when she was a student at Ohio State University. And what she spent a great deal of her time doing was pipetting, um, moving samples um, into um, centrifuges, doing all kinds of, of that sort of thing. She also had some responsibilities working with the mice who were the research um, uh, subjects in these experiments. So there are lots of different kind of uh, responsibilities that, that technicians have. They may have responsibilities in the laboratory with equipment, um, with supplies. They may be monitoring the day-to-day -day, um, activities of experiments, doing recording, doing reporting, and working directly with the professionals who are designing and responsible for the, stu the, the research itself. As I said, the titles that you're gonna find if you go looking on a job site for these kinds of positions, they're typically designated by the specific field of the lab that is seeking a tech. 
So you may have a biotechnician, a forensic science technician, a chemical technician. Um, there are also neuroscience technicians as well. Biotechnicians, for example, are going to work with living organisms. Um, the research may be medical or pharmaceutical in nature, or it may be basic science about microbiology. Um, broadly, science technicians are going to primarily be found working in laboratories. That may be in an academic setting where a researcher has grant funding and they hire someone um, to manage the lab. Um, they, those individuals may either be current students or they may be people hired for an hourly wage to do that work. They may also work in private laboratories, such as in the pharmaceutical industry. We have a, a recent graduate who works with a, a company, I believe it's in Northeast Ohio, but I could be wrong about that. Um, she basically manages so the animals that need to be produced um, for use in laboratory science. So, you know, rats and mice, for example. Um, and she's also involved in some other aspects of research at that company. A different kind of technician position is more applied. Um, and I have had a couple of students in the last decade or so, um, their first job right out of uh, Mount Union was a, a bachelor's level position as a psychiatric tech. Um, this is similar to being a medical technologist, but in a psychiatric context. Um, so what the, the psychiatric technicians do is to um, assist psychiatrists and other psychologists who work um, with people with mental illnesses, often in an inpatient or outpatient setting. The technician is going to follow instructions. Um, they're going to help people to navigate hospital procedures. They're going to monitor um, basic signs of physical and emotional well-being and report back to the medical staff. Um, so, you know, think about the analogous position of the, uh, the medical assistant or medical technician working in your physician's practice. They put you in a room, they take your vital signs, they ask you questions and record those notes into your file. Um, they may assist with a variety of other activities while they're at it. These technicians may also be trained with specific skills. Um, so in depending on what the practice is, um, they may learn to do uh, to use certain kinds of equipment and machines, such as is described in your chapter, biofeedback machines or electroencephalopathy. Allography, <laughs> that word gets me every time, EEG machines. Um, the specific example that your authors give you is about um, sleep clinics where a, a psychiatric technician or another kind of medical assistant is going to attach the electrodes so that um, EEGs can be run during the sleep study. That concludes my coverage of the first half of chapter eight.